It's time for the Wrestling Perspective Podcast. You can see us on Fight TV and anywhere you get your podcast. Just Google us. Don't be lazy. Listen, Lars, we yes. have a guy I'm excited about. Uh, Kyle Davis is a guy who I reached out to several, I don't know, four, five months ago. Uh, I got his email through another guy. I'm like, listen, I do a podcast with a guy named Lars Fredrickson. He's like, dude, I'm listening to his music right now. I will get you whoever you want on the podcast. I said, at some point, we want you on. He's like, listen, I'm going to big time you. I'm busy. I used to wear spandex and kick, kick people in the balls. But now I've made time for you. Kyle, <laughs> thank you for, like, stop doing your podcast with Billy, making the NWA go on hiatus so you can do this podcast with us tonight. I would have never said that I'd big league you. I have stumbled into a position in an industry that I always wanted to be a part of, and that's pro he wrestling. Stumbled, he's basically stumbled into this podcast. Right? I, I, I've done everything. So I am happy <laughs> that you want to talk to me because it shows that I exist outside of my circle of friends. And at the end of the day, every <laughs> individual wants to know that somebody knows that they're alive. And speaking of the podcast, that's right. I'm helping William Patrick Corrigan, Billy Corrigan, Smashing Pumpkins lead singer. His new podcast, 33, which is helping run out his new album. And Lars, I am starting to earn a respect for the talent of a gentleman that has put music and content out there for so long that people love, enjoy. And yet the thing that's blowing my mind is I'm seeing constantly that people still will shit on things that are just being given to them. Like, here's some new content. Enjoy it. Oh, I wish it was this. I wish it was that. Blah, blah, blah. I, I, I'm a nobody. And now being around people that are somebody's. I'm now tangentially seeing how tough it is. Like you're human beings. People don't realize that they just want to like give you shit. Like you aren't doing something you love and aren't just like, here, here's something. Enjoy it. Appreciate it. Just don't be mean about it. Well, you know, I mean, everybody's got an opinions. And as my mom used to say, opinions are like, Bubbles. I believe assholes, assholes, and they all stink. So, um, you know, no matter what you do in this world, if it's important, people are going to probably take shots at it. You know what I mean? So uh, obviously, if we're talking about the Smashing Pumpkins, you know, I mean, how many how many records did they sell? A gazillion. And then not only that, but the guy is such a huge pro wrestling fan. He gets involved with the NWA and brings and, you know, helps be and is a big part of bringing that back to life. I mean, I got nothing but respect for the guy. Uh, just first and foremost in the musical world. Secondly, now the wrestling thing and him being such a big wrestling fan like myself. I mean, you know, people are always going to try to take pot shots at you. And I think that, you know, it's one of those things. If this was the 1970s, 1980s, people would be fighting, you know, finding out where you live and going and punch you in the face for some of the shit that they say online. Now it's a whole different reality, you know, and, and people feel like they can get away with saying those things. And so they, they have a lot more freedom because they hide behind a computer screen. And, you know, that is what it is. I mean, they, you know, and, but, and especially with pro professional wrestling these days, I mean, you got so many internet booking agents now and so many fans out there. I wouldn't even call them fans. They're just, they're just opinions. They're like talking, not even as good as a talking head. You know, do they're you just, wanna, do you want to hear something really crazy? So my yeah. buddy, Pelly Primo, we broke into Ring of Honor together. That's how I came into the business. I was trained by Brian Danielson back in 06 at the ROH Academy. And Pelly Primo was another graduate of the ROH Academy. And he used to come out to Army of Zombies, one of yes. your songs. And the whole premise of it was, I was like, oh, that, that, that shit just slaps. It's good. And he goes, you know why it's why I have that, right? And he goes, no, it was a joke. Basically, every time I go out there, I'm fighting an army of zombies, which are these people that have no appreciation for anything the way it is other than how they want it to be. I am fighting an army of zombies, and those are the wrestling fans, which is a really just myopic viewpoint to have when you're breaking really into an is. industry. But at the same time, the older I get, the more I realize that really it was that specific type of internet fan that loves something so much and they just want to be a part of it. And the only way they can do that is just to try to get a reaction, which I understand completely. Yeah. But I just wish that everybody could just make things that people love and just appreciate it and say, like, I have more options and more opportunity to see and experience than I ever could have hoped for like 30 years ago. This is a fan's dream come true every day, no matter what you love. Television, movies, music. There is more content, more possibility and more things that are specifically targeted towards whatever the hell you like. Just be happy that you have that opportunity. 
Because I know when we were growing up, you had to, if you wanted to experience something new, you were lucky if you knew somebody that was slightly older or happened to stumble into some randomness that just like, oh, this resonates with me. How do I find that cool group? How do I find that thing that nobody else would have ever shared with me? And now you have the internet. Everybody can find everything. I mean, look at us. We are both covered with tattoos. Once upon a time, we were outliers of society. It was like, a for me, I started getting tattoos because I wanted to be able to express myself and have something out there and feel a little bit different and not everybody else was doing it. Now, I look around and I'm like, I look like everybody else. I am now, the like, I, I've got stuff that goes all the way up to my neck and I'm like this and the world's changed so much and I just wish people could appreciate, you know, be happy with what you have. Stop shitting on what you have. Well, you know, the tattoo thing is interesting. I'm sorry, Dennis, to cut you off, but it's interesting to me because, you know, having had these tattoos for, I mean, I'm 51 now and I started getting tattooed when I was, I got my first one when I was like 11. Damn. You know? What was the first so, one real quick? It was on my ankle, but it was on my shin originally, but I grew and my skin stretched and it moved to my ankle. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, there, you know, now you find it's, it's kind of like everybody thinks that you're a fucking chef now. Yeah. Or something, so. And, and I, I understand, you know, like I, like getting face tattoos, you know, and stuff like that. Now it's kind of sort of, it's, it's not even like, it doesn't even shock anybody. It doesn't provoke anything or, or anything like that anymore, which is totally fine. It is what it is, but um, yeah, I mean, you know, the narrative that, that you're talking, you know, it's so, it's, it's so. I mean, you can't argue it anymore. It's, 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 it's insane how the world, how quick the world has changed. And, you know, if you were to get a tattoo on, below your elbows or on your neck, that you, that was called an international, we called it, used to call them international job stoppers. Yeah, those career as you got, killers on the knuckles, the hands or anything. And now I tell people, stop, don't go all the way to the sleeve. And I'm like, it's not a social stigma or anything. It's Apple watches can't read through my tattoos. <laughs> like technology is not there yet. If you really want to be able to use modern shit, just give yourself a little skin. That's all. That's all. Yeah, go ahead, Dennis. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to make a joke about how you keep begging me not to get a face tattoo so I don't bring down your stock. No, it's fine. Just get something that really brings out like your your attractiveness there. Might, Maybe I'm like a, a full face drops. Yeah. yeah. For street cred, I'd be like, listen, I killed like four people already. I so. don't even think that counts. I think if you were to make that joke to people in this day and age, they wouldn't even get it. I mean, there's, I'm sure there's hipsters stupid enough to get that tattoo. But, <laughs> what, you know, whatever, you Look, know. Let's talk some wrestling. Yeah, for sure. Oh, all right, Cal. Uh, I became a big fan of yours based on how you treated me. And in the wrestling business, this is uh, – it's kind of hard because you don't see that a lot. It's you know every man for themselves, people protecting their territory. You have mentioned you came in with Ring of Honor. You've transitioned to – I think you're what – are you like a COO of – and yes, you know? I uh, I have a very fancy title with the National Wrestling Alliance, as well as being on camera. I also do help substantially backstage. And big shout out to Billy Corrigan for having faith in me when I quit my shoot real job and saying, I think I have a position for you. So thank you for that. Oh, You've I'm going to live at the beach. I'm going to ask you about your real job here in a little bit, but I, I just want to talk to you about that transition because, you know, oh, Petey Williams used to do the podcast with us and he's transitioning out of wrestling into producer. And, you know, as a friend, he talks a little bit about how he's kind of having trouble with just giving up wrestling. Was that an easy transition from you to go from a suit to spandex or from spandex to a suit? So, I never had the accomplishments that Petey Williams did. I well, Petey didn't I, even have those accomplishments. No, he, to the, to the <laughs> people on. in <laughs> he's parking on, cars right now. Canadian Destroyer was like the number one move for all of professional wrestling for like five years running, and then uh, Super Kicks came back, and then uh, you know Cutters as well. But let me tell you something. I came in as a fan of the industry. I was a uh, I like to say I was kind of like an awkward guy in his mid twenties looking for something to belong to. Uh, I always love this. I love comic books. Both things get you to be a superhero and play a character. Uh, I get in. I was never really athletic, but I could talk. Uh, eventually, I slimmed down, kind of become like a, a chicken shit heel in Ring of Honor, but I don't play politics well. So Gabe, who was the guy who ran Ring of Honor at the time, I, I just wanted him to notice me. And my way would be like, Gabe, look at you wearing a dress shirt today. Look at you really trying. Good for you, guy. Being kind of a dickhead. 
backfired. He never wanted to use me, but I got along with everybody. And as time went on, some people saw that like, you know, Kyle might not be the most athletic person ever, but he could talk. And Adam Pierce, who is now the authority figure on SmackDown, ended up going to me one day. He goes, Kyle, listen, you're the shits as a wrestler. And I'm devastated hearing this. I'm broken. He's like, but you could talk, which is more important. Why don't you get into broadcasting? And I had a real couple of moments there where I was like, well, I failed at what I wanted to do and all this stuff. I talked to Austin Aries and Austin Aries said, so basically you're being offered a job where you're going to appear on our television program every week for two to three segments. And you don't have to worry about getting dropped on your head. You don't have to worry about your diet. Yeah. You don't have to worry about this. You don't have to do that. And also you're going to be doing something that most people can't do, which means there's good likelihood. You're not going to be replaced mid season. Right. I was like, Oh, well, when you, when you put it that way, and it was just that idea of ego and thinking that there's something that you wanted to be in that you failed at it. I failed at being a professional wrestler. I never put in the work. I never put in the effort. I literally had a future Hall of Famer, a legend, a man who's going to go down in history as one of the greatest in our, our industry, Brian Danielson. And I didn't even try that hard because I didn't want to have to do 500 and do squats to start off the workout. I didn't want to do this. I didn't want to do that. I was the worst type of person there is. And that was somebody who was given a great opportunity and didn't put effort into it and then bitched about why things didn't work out for him. Become a broadcaster. We have the HD net show for about two years. And then I'm supposed to do tough enough with WWE. One of the Steve Austin seasons when we do that. And then right at like three weeks before and the producers go, you're on TV already. We can't use you. Whatever. I still have HD net. HD net gets canceled. And I go, okay. So in the span of, of like a month, I lost two things after everything's always worked out to me. And I have the egotistical thing of saying, well, if I'm doing it at this level, why would I do anything below that level? I'm going to wait until somebody comes along and sees my worth. So I took myself out of the professional wrestling industry and got into normal life because that was the wrong attitude to have. So when you said I treat you well, it's because I realized that an ego and thinking that somehow anybody's better than anybody else is just a way of making sure you don't go any farther in life. You're not going to have relationships. You're not going to have opportunities. You're not going to have anything. I became a normal guy that worked as a server at a hard rock in Orlando, which was great money. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it wasn't what I wanted to do with my life. It wasn't the dream. Thankfully, somebody just popped up during all of this after I became a restaurant manager and did all these things after eight years and said, Hey, Billy Corrigan starting a brand new wrestling company, or I should say not a new one, but he bought the national wrestling Alliance and he wants to restart it. We need a stick man. Would you be interested? It's in Atlanta where you're living. And I said, Oh, absolutely. He goes, good. Cause I already told him yes. And they brought me in and I was a guy who did running. I'd be backstage and grab people that need to go out to camera. And then they gave me a backstage position. And then, you know, Dave Marquez had some health issues. And so they put me at the podium and I did okay on that. And next thing you know, it just steamrolled. It's opportunity is what you make it. And I learned at a good young age through my own failures that if you don't use every opportunity you're given and you don't respect those opportunities, you're not going to have them. So if anything, I've just ended up stumbling into something by not being an asshole and just doing the job and respecting the people around me. Well, if you think of the greatest, I guess, you know, interviewers, people who set the tone, you know, you think of me and Gene Oakland, yes. you can, you can say Tony Schiavone, Joey you know, Styles was another one of my Joey favorites. Styles. You know, I mean, all these guys had a particular style and they could actually almost write and paint the picture for the audience or, even giving them a glimpse into the future, I almost feel like they had their own crystal ball, right? And they, they, could, they could make you think a certain way or, or push your thinking in a certain direction. And that's truly a gift. So when, you, when you're taking on this kind of responsibility, because now that's in essence what your job is, who do you hearken back to? Who do you, who do you go back to watch? Are you looking at tape and saying, oh, well, this guy you know, maybe did it this way? And like you said, Joey Styles, obviously maybe that's the guy for you. But like, how do you, do you see their little tricks of the trade when you watch and now so, that you're in the position? When I started doing the backstage stuff, I was very lucky that Ring of Honor at the time was kind of like the Wild West. Even though we started getting the TV show, we had kind of carte blanche to do what we wanted to do. And I was able to pretty much just be myself on camera backstage at a lowered thing, which makes it really easy. You know, they always say, if you want to be successful, kind of take a version of your personality and just throw it up a few notches. And part of me is I'm a smart ass, but I also am just react to everything. And a guy who I used to love that did that was Joey Styles. 
He was a smart ass on the mic. He was knowledgeable about the product. He could talk. But also when he ran his mouth and people would get into his face, he would react how he would, which is, I am not a wrestler. I'm, I think I might've just, you know, wrote a check that my ass can't cash. Um, but I also was always a big advocate of Mean Gene Okerlund. Uh, mean Gene, I got to meet once. He was doing an autograph signing when I was running a restaurant and he came in to do the autograph signing there. And I just told him, you know, hey, I tangentially was involved in the business as well. And this, and I said, the one moment that really stands out in my mind where you changed and made me as a fan realize that there's more to this than anything else was later. It was uh, around 1995. It was when Hogan was a baby face in WCW. He comes down and like a nitro, the crowd's booing him. Mean Gene Okerlund looks around, does his little finger up to the lips. He goes, uh, <clears throat> the crowd here is obviously upset about the way the world is, but very happy to see Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan, thank you for joining me. <laughs> and he immediately repainted the picture. Oh, they're not booing Hogan. They're just upset about something else. They're happy he's here. It, it is that idea of what you said. You can paint a picture. You could rewrite the history around you. You could lead people to the water and hope they drink from it. Um, at, at the end of the day, yes, I accidentally do emulate people just like I think anybody does that's a fan of anything. Um, if you've watched something long enough, you start picking up at things and ingrained. I'm sure I quote movies that I loved as a child all the time and music and everything else and sketch comedy. But for the most part, it, it's finding your own voice and then being, what can I do with this? And luckily, uh, Billy Corrigan has enough faith in me that he kind of lets me have my own voice, which sometimes gets me in trouble because, again, Jeez. that smart ass comes out at the podium. Like every now and then I think I could take Nick Aldis in a fight, but then I see us on camera next to each other. And I'm like, never mind. I fit inside him. He might charge you to fight him. I feel like that would be a very legit thing. We'd be like, oh, oh, Kyle. And then he'd roll his eyes at me and make me feel bad about it. Uh, yeah. Well, we're, we're rolling our eyes at him. Dennis. Uh, so are you done with your in-ring career? Now, admittedly, you know, you, you, you're making this transition. Is there still that itch that, you know what, maybe for the right storyline, you know, uh, podium stick guy versus wrestler picking on me. Do we, do you see that anything in your future? I'm like five, eight and a half at this point in my life. I swear I've gotten you look smaller like a as the age. Oh, thank you. I could you tell my wife that because no, she's constantly no. telling me when I put five nine down that you're lying to yourself. And I say it's because you have hair. That's why you think that I'm shorter than I am. Um, no, I post like gym photos and stuff like that. My goal is I turned 40 in January, so I want to be like in the best shape of my life while I go on a mushroom vision quest in Mexico. Um, yeah. That's happening. Can't wait for it. It's going to be great. Hope I really find out some deep shit about myself that's really been holding me back in life. Um, but getting it in shape and stuff like, like that. that, I know I'm probably going to cry and just vomit on myself. <laughs> um, but but win, like win. I, I, I win win. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> people will be there. It'll be fantastic. There will be photos and video. Um, I realized my limitations, and I even when I was wrestling, I wasn't doing flippy stuff i wasn't a jumper again i'm a short man i remember doing lucha passes which for wrestling fans if you don't know what that is instead of leapfrogging people you kind of step to the side and push them through homicide does them and i love it when he does them because i say homicide does it and nobody gives him shit why did people give me grief and then i remember that i was in ring of honor in 2006 that's why um but the, the fact of the matter is i have no qualms about that my neck bothers me uh my sciatica acts up it's true what they say like when you hit 40 weird things start happening uh, thank God I can still maintain a, a very solid uh, manhood. But uh, other than that, I'm not getting back in the ring. It's not for me. If something happens, one thing could occur or another. But at the end of the day, I look awesome in person when you have me sitting just alone. I'm, I'm jacked. When I'm tanned, I look great. But when you put me next to a human being that is also on this roster, I am a very tiny person, which means I'll never lose my job at the podium because everybody looks huge next to me. So let me ask you a question. Um, doing what you're doing now, I'm sure like, you know, it, it, when you're in ring, there's obviously difficulties. There's all, obviously people who are maybe green or, you know, maybe forgetting or whatever it may be. You know, now you're in this place where you have the majority of the control and it's, and it's almost like the wrestler can cut his throat at any point or become a superstar overnight. And it's just like, we, like we've been talking about it's like, you know, the fact that you're able to talk is the reason why you still have a job. Who's been the hardest and, you know, to, to, for you to interview. And it's not like a slag and I'm not, it's not a dirt sheet thing. It's more or less like, 
let me let me rephrase the question so you don't have to name names. Have you had a lot of people who have been hard when it comes to interviewing them and pushing the storyline? So one of the things that I do not excel at is if you give me Kyle, say this word for word. I am atrocious at it. And I know certain other companies for the longest time, if you want to have an interview or have a discussion or do any sort of on-camera promo, you had to pretty much be that person. I am very much, this is the gist of it. Let's play off each other. No matter what happens, happens. Uh, I feel like it's one of the things that really is sink or swim with the National Wrestling Alliance is when you step up to that podium, you're either going to succeed or fail. Now, there's a whole whole plethora of individuals that once you put a microphone in front of them they are unstoppable matt cardona is somebody who i don't even have to know what we're going to talk about we just run with it uh vsk is somebody that i was just talking to the other day one of the up-and-coming guys who's both for us and has appeared on aw programming as a butler of all things but like he can run his mouth to the point where sometimes i'm almost like man I i'm Am I going to get lost in this and not be able to catch up? Nick Aldis is a great talker, and he could do everything impossible. Now, on the other end of that, there are individuals that struggle with it, and it comes down to a confidence thing. It's like anything else. You got to put in the reps. And if you're not used to talking and you're not used to on the fly having a discussion with somebody, it is very easy to get stumbled up. I've had people where I've asked a question of them that they were unprepared for, and then I just get dead eyes. I'm not going to name names, but – and then my goal as a – broadcaster is I now have to try to guide that person to where I need them to be or help them or give them an out or explain why, because I don't want them to look foolish. I don't want them to feel foolish. So yes. Well, uh, okay. So sorry, I needed to, to, to double back on this. No, question. go so, back for it. So are, are you privy to where the storyline needs to go uh, in there, general? There are times where I will know where we're going. And then there are times where I don't know, which is 50 50 and mm. so it can be exciting but there's also times where i've started talking to somebody and by the end of it i was like oh i don't know if this is going to get us to anywhere we were supposed to be or even the hell we were supposed to be there's other times where things are supposed to happen and they don't and then you have to play along i literally had one episode where something was supposed to happen where i was talking to the fixers and nothing happened and so I'm buying time thinking maybe there's a delay and I accidentally start basically propositioning the fixtures to be my muscle. If I wanted to go make a drug deal, just literally I, for some reason, I was like, let me buy time. This will never see the air. And then I turn on NWA USA and here we are me talking to him and going. So what if I had a little help on the side and I needed some muscle in case something went wrong when I went to go make a purchase? And I'm like, Jesus, we posted me talking about this. <laughs> so yeah, there, there's times where you don't know where it's going. Like uh, we have a few people where, I will be like, hey, what are, what are we doing out there? And they'll be like, just feel it. And that's my favorite because I can do no wrong. Inversely, I've also had people tell me that. And then literally when we get out there, the first thing I say, everything goes good. We get backstage and he's like, uh, I can't believe you did that. I go, what? He goes, you literally said the exact same thing I was going to say at the beginning. And I had nowhere I knew where I was going to go from that point on. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, it, it is what it is, but that is the skill. If Let's face it. We are an entertainment business that is incredibly physical. Quarter of an inch, the wrong move. You are crippled. You are broken. You are battered. Uh, and it's it's the weirdest thing ever. It is a soap opera that is physicality and requires you to be an athlete and be able to handle abuse. You also have to think on your feet. It's improv. It's choreography. It's ballet with chairs. It's a weird, stupid thing that's unlike anything else. And you need to be able to flow with it at any given time. It's like they say in a car accident. If you're all bunched up and stuff, like when a drunk driver gets into a car accident, they're usually fine because they're loosey-goosey and going along with anything else. But if you're stiff and you're not willing to go with what's happening, you're either going to get hurt, you're going to hurt somebody else, or you're going to get lost. I don't know if any of this is making sense, guys. My apologies. Oh, it is. It is. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I ramble. I can't help it. No, no, it's all right because that brings me into my next question, which is if you had a Hall of Famer and Danielson teach you how to wrestle, who taught you how to hold the stick? I literally was just watching wrestling. I used to, back in the day, I had have VHS tapes of ECW promos. It was my favorite wrestling company to this day. I would have VHS tapes, and then I had it set up to a dual cassette player, and I would mm. hit play and record promos on the little cassette tapes, and I would just listen to them all the time. Uh, it was all basically ECW stuff. You know, Steve Austin, when he first got there, Mick Foley promos. I was a big Shane Douglas fan. 
Um, and then as time went on, you know, I, I would start listening to people like Flair and stuff because I'm from Connecticut. I'm a New England guy. So my NWA stuff was VHS tapes at a local video store and the good video stores, not the blockbusters, the ones with like the fun stuff back that go through the curtain you to find the good stuff. Um, so for me, the one thing that I actually really had other than WWF was ECW just because of where I grew up. And that was the thing that got me into promos is just listening, seeing reactions of people. Those Pulp Fiction segments used to freaking get me every time. And it's amazing because now I get to work with so many of those people. And, you know, I don't know, Lars, if you ever had this experience, but working with people that you had, you were a fan of at some point before yeah. that, it, it's kind of crazy. And the great thing is, is that if you're at a certain level and you could carry yourself and create, they will respect you as an equal. And that is something that's always blown my mind. I remember the first person that ever was somebody that I was a fan of that I got to work with that actually like treated me like an equal was Jerry Lynn. In Ring of Honor, I used to watch him in ECW. He comes into Ring of Honor. They do the whole wrestler thing where he's like, you know, it's the end of his career. He ends up working another 20 years after this, of course, but he becomes the ROH champion. And we would do promos with each other on camera. And Jerry was always a wrestler. He wasn't a big talker. So he'd be like, I just don't know where to go with that. And he'd be like, what do you think? And he would ask me questions and I'd help him with the promos. And this is a guy who I was a huge fan of that had enough faith in my abilities to get him to where he needed to be. And that's when I realized like, their imposter syndrome's real. Literally, you could be the greatest at something and be at a certain level. And if you don't believe in yourself, you're going to think everybody's going to one day find out that you're full of shit and you're lying to them. I still have it to this day. But that was one of the first people that made me feel comfortable enough to say, hey, maybe there's a reason you're here. And Jerry Lynn is a great dude, man. I got a chance to hang out with him when we when we worked, did the little thing for AEW for Ruby. And he's got a great mind. And just an overall nice guy. And you mentioned Christopher Daniels, who I used to see over, uh, you know, because I'm a California guy. I used to see him on the indies yep. out here a lot. And uh, even saw him in Japan when he was Curry Man at a show. Um, so you got these guys and we're talking about, you know, future Hall of Famers, maybe. Um, why don't you think the wrestling aspect of your career didn't click? Other, I understand that you're a lazy, fat son of a bitch. I totally get that. <laughs> ding, and ding, total, baby. Total, complete asshole. But what what do you think it was? What, what do you think it was? Was it the drive? Because it doesn't sound like that was the thing, you know. No, no, it was, it was like, the drive. That, no, you're right. Drive. You nailed it. I, I literally had so many cool things come up in my life. I had every opportunity. I uh, got invited to move to L.A. at one point and work at the New Japan Dojo, which, you know, looking back at the people that were there, uh, Nakamura had just left, but he made a few tri trips back there. So it's like Devitt and, you know, Carl Anderson and then Ricky Romero and Brian would go back and forth there. And I was very comfortable and I was like, hey, wrestling's kind of a weekend thing for me. I didn't think about it as a career and a future and as something that I could ever really be a giant part of. Cause I didn't believe in myself and mm. that is what held me back. Uh, Kevin Steen, who's now Kevin Owens, you know, him and I hit it off and he's like, Hey, if you guys ever want to come up to Canada, you know, I'll get you guys booked there. And you know, you want, I'm like, Oh, thank you. And I never took him up on it because that seemed like a lot of effort. <laughs> Meanwhile, you got a guy like one of my best friends in the business, Rhett Titus, who also came through the ring of honor training Academy. He's one of Austin Aries guys, Rhett. When I was training, would literally try to work three times a weekend at least. He would wow. show up at indie shows that I'd be there with them and trying to break in and do stuff. And he'd be like, uh, they'd want him in the main event against like Raven. And he'd be like, um, I'm sorry. Uh, can I be in like the opening match? I, I, I'm double booked. I have to go to this other show that's like an hour away. He would try to get as much work in it every time because he realized the more situations I put myself in, the more I do, the more I learn, the more people I wrestle, the better I'm going to become. It wasn't an inconvenience. Me, I was like, well, if I spend $50 to get there and I make $10, that doesn't make sense. Not going to do that, yeah. which is a rational, safe way of thinking. But it's a real world thought process. People in entertainment don't become successful by having a real world thought process. You have to think about this is the thing I'm passionate about. This is what I love. That's that's a stupid. Why are you going to do that? Because who knows what three people are going to see me and who knows who's going to hear this and who knows what I'm going to learn from this trip. You know, wrestling is like being in a band. You have to come up with your own, your own stick. You have to promote yourself. You're not always going to have the most successful day. Sometimes you're going to take a loss, but you're basically just hoping 
that the more you go out there, the more people are going to experience you and the more it's going to connect with somebody. The exactly. internet has made that so much easier for everybody. But oh. I legit look at, at individuals who have made a name for themselves. Rancid, who the fuck doesn't know who Rancid is? The fact of the matter is, in modern day America, there could be 37 Rancids that nobody will ever hear about because there's a thousand of them online. The fact of the matter is it's so hard now to make a connection because everybody has the same opportunity. No matter what you do, there's just too much content. It's like having a number one TV show. What does it matter? Nobody's ever going to see it because there's too much shit going on. But back in the day, if you were able to be at the right place at the right time, you would resonate because nobody realized that there might be other people just like that out there. You are one of a kind. You are golden. You are an innovator. And I think that's something that's really lost on people today is how do you become the only version of you? Like people shit on Dan Housen. Oh, it's a comedy thing. I've never seen another Dan Housen. I've never seen that. I've never seen anything he does before. And I don't care if you're like, uh, the wrestling, this, that is a unique individual. That is somebody else. Uh, it, it really does just, it blows my mind how much of a challenge it is for people today, but it also blows my mind even more so how anybody was ever successful not living in the world we live in today, not with the internet, you know, just I, again, one in a million right here. Let me let me ask you this, because uh, I love everything you're saying, but at what point and and how did you start going from victim to accountability? Ooh. Uh Basically, after a couple of years of not being involved in the wrestling industry, I had to start looking back and think about like, well, a lot of this probably falls on me. Um, <laughs> I was in a relationship at the time off and on for a long time, and I was a real shitty partner to her because when I broke into the business, I had the bullshit idea of like, well, I got to have a girl in every town. I was a pretty boy. I had great hair. I was lean. Uh, really? I, I didn't I, see I, a picture of this. Oh, I was damn <laughs> handsome. When I was Kyle Durden, I, I do feel like I was pretty goddamn handsome. I was unstoppable. <laughs> you know what? When, and listen, Kyle Durden just sounds like a dick. I, I said eye candy on my groin on my gear. I have a tattoo of it right here. That used to be in pink and purple on my dick. Um, that held up well. Yeah, I tell you. What can I say? <laughs> uh, subsequently, when I moved to Atlanta, somebody broke into my car and stole the gear bag out of my trunk. And I was like, well, I guess that means I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> jokes on them they're like i can't wait to get all this money what the hell is this pink and purple singlet with glitter that says eye candy on the dick what why is this but the, the the accountability comes with age it comes back and looking by and i really did after that relationship fell apart start thinking about like what what did i do did i did i put the effort in this and then um when you realize that your relationships might not be living up to what they are because of you and what you're putting into them instead of just trying to get out of it that's when you really start thinking about it also, becoming a leader in business really helped me as I went from having a, a job in the service industry with just no real responsibility to, well, I want to be able to have a salary and I want to be able to have insurance. And I want to see where the world takes me and I want this, that. And, you know, I start getting into management in corporations is when I started being like, oh, like if somebody doesn't want to take accountability for what they did and that pisses me off, how hypocritical of it, it was me to do that when I was that person. And a lot of that is just looking into yourself and realizing at the end of the day, like I'm responsible for my own actions. I can also help people realize that don't make people feel like shit about things like empathy is a big deal. And the more empathetic I got, I think the better person I became, the better leader I became, and the more I was able to kind of grow as a human being, which has got me to where I am today which is middle-aged helping run a wrestling company and having a podcast with a rock star and being here with another rock star. So this is pretty effing cool. When, when he's talking about you, Lars, not me. Well, uh, I was just looking over at you cause I was, I was uh, trying to get angry for my next question. Ooh, um, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Bring the rage. I'm here for it. Uh, well, you know, I mean, like you said, there's a lot of one of the things I was, I took, from what you were saying was that there is a lot of choice out there now, especially for professional wrestling, you know, any night of the week, you can watch something. There's so many companies. There's so much content out there. Tuesday, the people... NWA power on fight and Saturdays, NWA USA. Sorry. I just had to get that. Sorry to interject. That's okay. <laughs> um, you know, working with guys like Ricky Morton and some of the old homicide, even, you know, a lot of these older cats, you know, um, how do you think, in your opinion, do they stay as relevant as they are? 
Is it their experience or is it, um, you know, is it, is it something that they have that you see in them? My question, I'm trying to get to it. I was going to try to parallel it between like the newer kind of up and comers, the Ricky Morton's, the homicides, these guys have been mainstays in professional wrestling. Do you see that in a lot of the talent there at NWA? I do, in fact. And I think at the and end of the day. And who are those people? Uh, people that I feel like one day are going to be very powerful in the background. I, I can tell you one person who I keep on telling him and it, he gets pissed at me. This is when I said that, you know, Adam Pierce told me that I was probably doing something that I shouldn't be doing and I should focus on this. One of my best friends in the wrestling industry is Sal Renaro. Sal Renaro has been in almost every wrestling company doing every damn thing. And yet he is somebody who a lot of people don't appreciate. And the thing that I keep on telling him is, I really think that you should be an agent. You should be a guy that helps everybody else out. And he's like, no, because that means my wrestling career is over. And I always tell him like, look at, look at people like Jamie Noble and just these people that are badass wrestlers that because of nothing that they've ever done, something about like height, just a stigma of you don't fit the mold of what we're looking for. Never got the chance to shine, but have a brain that's built for wrestling that can help everything and also convertly can convey that to other people that do have those common denominators that these big companies are looking for. And they can help those people succeed in ways that nobody would ever think. That's a hell of a legacy is to be able to say, hey, I help build the future of the industry. Like I work with Dr. Tom Pritchard now in the NWA. Tom Pritchard helped train like Kurt Angle, you know, Edge. He was there for like everybody during that era. He was also a body Donna, which I think is pretty effing cool. But the fact of the matter is, is like there's all these people that have so much understanding, ability, and they can help other people. It's one thing to get yourself over. It's another thing to be able to help 30, 40, 50 people become the best professional wrestler they can. And so I'm constantly on him. I'm like, dude, you – People respect you. People listen to you. How many times have people come to the locker room and be like, hey, uh, I need help with a finish or I need this or I need that. And you just kind of go like, okay, so uh, here you go. And you just help them and you treat it so nonchalantly like it's not a big deal. I am constantly surrounded by people like him. You're probably exactly like this. I know Billy Corrigan's like this is people that excel at something and they don't realize it. And they just treat it like it's everyday thing. Like, yeah, I, I just created this damn thing from scratch. Like musicians. I can't read music. I can't write music. I can't play an instrument. I can't sing. When you can do all those things, sometimes it's easy to forget that that is not something that every human being can do and that you are some kind of magical unicorn that can do things that no one else can do. That is one of the things. Sal Renaro, I think, is a guy who's going to be great there. I also have a lot of things. Black G's. Black G's has a mind for wrestling that I think, given the right opportunity, would be amazing at any major wrestling promotion. There's also people that I've known in my career that unfortunately their life is cut short. So it's it's just one of those deals where you never know who is going to get an opportunity at the right time. So you just have to be the best version of yourself because somebody's going to stumble into it. Hell, I stumbled into an opportunity. You're talking to me because somebody who was a producer for Ring of Honor that I became friends with had an opportunity and said, Hell, Kyle will probably do it. And I've built myself up from being a guy who was just running people to the curtain to helping run a wrestling company. You never know what's going to happen. Just don't be an asshole. Treat people with respect. Have a little empathy and try to make people happy around you. All right. I definitely want to jump back into it, but I do want to talk a little bit about the NWA here and its direction it's going where as a fan and Lars and I many times on many different podcasts have talked about how uh, – Listen, sure, being on YouTube TV feels right in a nice, safe spot, but it, it deserves a much bigger platform. And I and I'm sure that you guys, you know, might be happy with the direction it's going. But are there plans to try to bring it over to a bigger platform where uh, we as friends feel like fans, not friends, but feel like no, it, you could totally be my friend. Don't don't ever think you can't be. You guys are welcome to come wherever I am. I I. Seriously, free tickets. I you hang. just said free tickets, Lars. That's what I just said. Of course, that's, that's what I heard. I heard <laughs> I get to go to catering too. Yeah, no problem. It's Chipotle sometimes. Other times it's like uh, little sandwiches, but you know it's tasty. Hey, I hope the right. dirt sheets pick that up. Catering at, at NWA Chipotle. 
There's nothing wrong with it. It's so good. Think it about is. it. We're a bunch of body guys. You get a little bowl there. You get a little protein, a little bit of rice, maybe some guac. Oh, good time. Shit. And answer the question. Okay, so Shit. answer the question is we are always – trying to grow and i am lucky enough to have a guy who runs the company who has a vision and that vision is nothing happens overnight unless you have you know tony khan money and tnt and everything behind you we're our own entity we we're going to try to build this as much as we can are we looking to the future is 2023 on the horizon and big things on the way yeah I'm I'm very much hoping to. I can't share with you what's going on, but there are a multitude of things. My he would kill me. He would murder me. And I don't think that would be good for his new album, which is coming out, Autumn, which is going to be releasing there in the podcast 33. A lot. I don't know. I bet online. And if Billy Corgan starts murdering people, I think people will probably have heat with him. Or who knows? Maybe they become bigger fans. I hope we never have to find out about that. Um you know, the YouTube thing that we used to have going on got so many viewers, but it doesn't bring in any money. And at the end of the day, if you are running a business, you do have to be concerned about profit and loss. Um, basically, right now we have the fight deal. We stream first run programming on there on Tuesdays with power. And then we do the replay on YouTube on Fridays. We also do our pay-per-views on there. Uh, fight is a great place. Obviously, you plugged Fight at the very beginning of this, except every now and then, I accidentally say fight.com and they get mad because it's fight.tv and then you know they give me a little email and say, hey, Kyle, get that shit right. Um, but we're happy to be a part of that and who knows what the future is going to bring. All I can say is be it network television, a reality show, anything that could possibly be happening on the horizon, 2023 hopefully is looking to be a big ass year because I want to be a part of this because at the other day, my name is partly on this and I don't want to be a part of something that I did not help succeed as much as I could. Cause I learned from my own life and my youth effort gets results. Okay. I need your take on, you know, these guys who are not wrestlers who come into the business. I have my opinions about it. You know, you got your Logan Paul's, you got your, uh, uh, action Bronson's. Uh, I just saw David bunnies. Arquette the other day at our TV tapings. He was hanging well, out. David Arquette has, you know, put in some work though. He I'm has. Be but so, what is your what is your thoughts on like guys that 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 you know, for instance, rappers and or actors or you know, what what do you think about them coming into the business? I mean, I have my opinion. I, I, some of them I, I'm into. Some of them I'm just like, eh, you know, don't I quit your day job that one of the biggest things to ever happen to professional wrestling was in the eighties. And that was rock and wrestling connection when Cindy Lauper ended up becoming a part of the, of WWF. At the right. Time but she involved. wasn't a wrestler. No, she, she wasn't, wasn't a wrestler, wrestler but then that's what I'm saying. Mr. I, T prefer- was Mr. Yes T they brought no. into the match. Yes and no. Okay. Logan Paul, not a wrestler, but an athlete nonetheless. And when I watch a Logan Paul match, I same thing with bad bunny. I never knew who Bad Bunny was. I am 40. I'm not hip. I'm not cool. I don't have kids. I don't follow Latin music. I am not as cool as I wish I was. So when I saw Bad Bunny, I was like, who the hell is this guy? Then I saw him in the ring and I said, whoever the hell this guy is, he looks like he put the effort and he tried. That is all anybody asks for. The big thing I think is if you could watch somebody get into the ring that has never been a part of wrestling, if you make a connection with them, you can live vicariously through them and be like, holy shit, they're doing it. That means I could do it. It gives you a little bit of hope. There's other times where you see somebody get in the ring and you're like, I don't think they put in any effort. Uh, you know, we've all seen like a Dennis Rodman wrestling match. Nah. So but again, Snoop, or Carl Snoop Malone, though. <laughs> yeah. But Carl Malone, when I saw him in a match, I was like, oh shit. I think he's really going to hit that diamond cutter and I'm going to believe. It's like anything else. If you put in the work and you make people connect and believe, I feel like you can do no wrong and I'm not going to shit on somebody for trying to be a part of something they love. Because at the end of the day, everybody in the wrestling industry, for the most part, there's some people that come in that are just like, hey, I was a college athlete and I want to do this thing because I think it could make a couple of bucks. But 95% of the people that break into wrestling are because they were fans and they wanted to be a part of this. And at the end of the day, everybody on this earth is a fucking human being. You're a well, human I, being. You're a you are a successful musician. You are somebody who people you'll never know you have connected with and influenced on a manner of which is unreasonable for most people to ever be able to have that power over somebody. 
but you like wrestling because there was something about it that connected with you as a person, be it your right. youth, and, be it something yes. else. Yes, but I know know that I would never get in the fucking ring. My point is, is that the, uh, what I'm trying to get at is what what is your personal thought, like really personal thoughts? Because you've done that work, you've done that that time with Chris Daniels. Yeah, you were a fat, lazy son of a bitch who didn't want to do shit. I understand that's been well established. <laughs> I just wanted to call it with great I hair. Just to call it, yeah, with gray hair, and, and you know, you used to have a little thing on on your cock and everything. And we get that, but. <laughs> But my, I, but, but, you know, what is, it's like bad bunny. Okay. Stole the fucking show. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, here we go. Action Bronson. I'm rooting for him. I, I want hope him so to too. Fucking, I want him to kill it because I know that dude's like 100% a wrestling fan. He yes. might be like a, he might be a wrestler trapped in a rapper's body. Like you never know. So, but and I want to see him succeed. There's a few of these reality TV stars that, you know, I did never wanted to see and they're there. Um, Mike Mazan was a reality TV star that nobody wanted to see and became somebody who love him or hate him is an amazing professional wrestler. He's a, I, if you're talking about the Miz, I think that's his real name, but like, and he's a nice, nicest dude, super cool, whatever. And I'm not, and I'm not, you know, I can take it or leave it. It's not like that. He was my argument that I was using. Everybody has a first time doing anything. Anybody who's willing to try something. Well, then the, I'm time. sorry. If he was the argument that you're using, you don't have a fucking leg to stand on. <laughs> well, I'm, what I'm saying is that n- and no matter what walk of, life, what walk of life they are, like you put the effort in, you make a little thing, you try. If somebody tries, you never know if that person's going to end up being the thing that hits and they find out they love wrestling and well, they go Ms. from there and commit everything. You can't was, shit on. Uh, you can. No. Sorry. No, no, I'm not shitting on Miz. I'm just saying Miz wasn't my example. I was talking about the people who just kind of come in and go out. Miz obviously went in there, w- busted his ass. You're talking about like, the one duns that seem like they have no passion for the correct, business. Correct. If it brings more eyes to the product, more power to it. Mike Tyson was somebody who was a guest referee for one match, had a couple appearances, and more people started watching professional wrestling in the late 90s because of him than almost anything anybody could have done in a 10-minute match wearing spandex. That person gave a lot of insight and a lot of people's entry level. It's like a drug. The first taste was Mike Tyson for people, a guy who's not a professional wrestler. He's not going to be there. You don't really see him ever again after that. That is the type of thing where I think I can't be pissed at it because if more people enjoy and discover the thing that I'm involved in, no matter how it happens, I can't be mad at it because, damn it, those people got brought there in a way that none of us could have done it. Fair enough. Uh, you know, along the same lines, you, the company's owned by someone kind of like that, where you have a, you know, Billy, major rock star owning the company. Is there a internal battle with him? And I don't want to make this like, hey, we're interviewing Kyle about Billy, but is there some sort of like internal ba- battle where he's a wrestling fan? And let's be honest, if I owned a company, I would try to be on camera as much as possible. Where so he doesn't basically, want- Dennis wants to know, is he still a rat in a cage? So... <laughs> You know, my favorite part of the podcast is I get to ask questions like that, like the shit that everybody was like, just don't don't bring up music to to Billy. It's something that he's really passionate about. And he's he's set. He's one of those people that he's a rock star, but at the same time, he is very shy. And so sometimes when you put him on the spot about shit, his first reaction is, am I is this person attacking me? Are they shitting on me? Are they making me feel like I'm a kid again? Uh, For the most part, I got to be honest with you. We used to battle with Billy about promoting himself as part of the national mm. wrestling Alliance. He was like, yeah, he's like, I don't, I don't think people care that I'm involved in it. He's like, I just want the wrestling to stand as the wrestling is. So the more he's on camera is actually our doing to pressure him because we're like, listen, you're a recognizable person for so many people that you just being a part of this, be it, you know, just curiosity or people actually being immensely invested, they will pay attention because they'll be like, what, what the hell is that guy? I was, I, I do, you know, ring announcing now because let's face it, let's do 30,000 things. Um, and I'm ringside ring announcing and he came out during a show and there was a dude at the corner. He goes, holy shit, is that Billy Corrigan? Is that the special pumpkins guy? He had no idea. He just happened to be at a wrestling show. And then he got very confused about why that guy was coming out to make an announcement. <laughs> so like it is one of those things where most people would think, oh, does this person want to be on camera? He does not want to be on camera. Well, it's you just know, what? sometimes just... that happens. 
I got to say much respect to Billy Corgan because, and I got a lot of freaking respect from him just in the musical world, but just for taking on the NWA, bringing it back, giving us product, using that name, you know, the, the aesthetic, he's brought everything about back to the, it's, I mean, to have a part in that, I bat my, my hat goes off to you, Billy Corgan. So that's what I wanted to say. Sorry to interrupt and no. keep interrupting. It's your show. You're fucking right. So then my last question is going to be, it's my show, Dennis. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. So, you know, what we've seen transpire in wrestling over the last couple of weeks, you know, it seems like the tabloid wrestling sheets, you know, have sort of made it mainstream now. They used to be a very underground for the boys or for people who just really, like it's only the people that I knew that I read the Wrestling Observer or some of these other wrestling news sheets were – we're, we're not the casual wrestling fan. They were the ones that like, you know, tape traded and, and did all this stuff. So now that we're seeing that influence, you know, cause they obviously get the stories wrong or maybe 80% right. But then there's a lot of hearsay and bullshit that comes with it. And do you think that's damaging to the, to, to uh, wrestling in the long run? Or do you think it's just one of those things that's like maybe a flash in the pan? The reason why I ask you this is because you're the guy now that's taking the lead with the stick and moving the show. I, I think you could look at it two different ways. And I am guilty of looking at things online. And, you know, when I was younger, there used to be right when I first got the internet, there was a thing for the new England independent wrestling scene called the declaration of independence, which was just a melting pot of garbage, just the worst type of things that people would say but it was essentially a dirt sheet for just all of New England indie wrestling. Mm -hmm. um, and it's legendary for anybody that was of my age that was around there. I think Tony Khan was probably on the damn thing, to be honest with you, at one point in time. Um, the the sheets, this stuff, everybody loves rumor. Everybody wants to feel like they're a part of something. And I think by going on there and reading about things, you feel like you are, you know a little bit more than the average person and that somehow you're a part of everything that goes on. Is everything you read accurate? No, not everything you read on Twitter is accurate. Nothing you ever get information-wise is ever accurate. When we were younger, at least if there was a news story, they would take like, unless it was something devastating, they would research it and then, you know, make sure it was actually correct, fact-checked. Then you'd see that and they'd do like a 60 minutes thing on something. Now we live in an instantaneous environment where everybody's so quick to get a news bite out there that you never really know if something's accurate or not. And then one, it's the telephone game. You know, you say one thing, then somebody else interprets it, then they share it, and then that's that. So by the time it's first reported on, like, let's say, Fightful, by the time it gets to the fifth version of it, it might be a completely different wrestling news story. And that's just unfortunately how it is. And that could at times be very bad. You know, I remember... Well, it is, the it, well I mean, it, has been, it has been very bad. I mean, you know, an incident happened, obviously, people get suspended, but this is what I'm talking about. Like now the wrestling dirt sheets now have become mainstream and because of things that they've reported in irresponsible sort of, you know, uh, journalism in a lot of ways and based on hearsay or just one person's opinion without facts is now created an issue, right? So uh, accountability life again, if, if there wasn't smoke and there wasn't fire, there wouldn't be repercussions. So there's times where real things get reported. There's times where giant individuals in the wrestling industry turn out to have handed out a shit ton of hush money that people speculated about for many, many years. And all of a sudden things come out and they have to step away from their company. There are things where, you know, maybe somebody in the industry was not the best human being. And then a bunch of people make a comment about it. And all of a sudden that person isn't allowed to do a lot of shit that could harm other people in the business. As much as we shit on it, as much as we think that maybe this is really bad. Sometimes it takes somebody to make a, a vocal opinion about something or point something out that could really help change things. Now, it's a double-edged sword. It could backfire, and it could be some shit that's not real that ruins somebody's career or somebody thinks, like, so-and-so has an attitude backstage because I read it online. That's not right. always true. Um, but I can also be very honest about this. For the most part, if somebody's going to be talking about something – on that level, it's because somebody said something to somebody or somebody witnessed something or this, that, and the other thing. The worst part about it is when people in the wrestling industry make up shit about somebody else knowing full well 
that they can control things through that. That's the big problem is people exploiting, you know, dirt sheets and social media and all this other stuff. At the end of the day, it's like any other form of media. You take it for what it is, which is tangible at best at times. And you just hope that there's enough fact checking and enough honesty behind things where nothing really messed up happens and comes from it. So do I think the dirt sheets are bad? I think it's like anything else. If used improperly, it's horrible. But if used correctly, you can also make people feel invested in something that sometimes they might not have been in the same way. I remember I was a big Brian Pillman fan, you know, the rogue horseman, and he was a giant internet advocate. And they used the entire storyline where, you know, the Bischoff thing released me from the contract. I want this, I quit this. Like he used a bunch of rumor and dirt sheet stuff to build his name up and go to WWF, which is a place he never would have made it otherwise. Right. Um, so there's, there's ways of it. And again, that kind of inversely goes to it. If you're working the dirt sheets to make yourself better without burying anybody else, bravo. But if you have to bury people that don't deserve it to make yourself look better, shame. Just go fuck yourself. Shame on you. Fair it's enough. like Thank anything you. else. So dirt sheets, dirt sheets, not, not not the greatest thing, not the worst thing, but it's the society we live in. It's not changing. We got to deal with it. It's almost like recording with Petey where he's just right there on the line and won't give you a, a one way or another answer. I like it. But I, I feel like I'm I'm being very open and honest and saying a bunch of shit that I, somebody's going to have a problem with. I Well, I feel like you're being <laughs> honest and open too. Yes. It's just, it's, it's, uh, you know, obviously – Whatever. It's a hot topic. But Dennis. but no, the truth is, is I, I can't shit on something that I look at. Yeah. I can't, I can't plainly say, oh, this is garbage. It shouldn't exist. When I, since I've been a teenager, have been supplementing, so listen, this, adding to it. I, I, I would, you know, I, I have my old wrestling observers downstairs in the garage. I, you know, I've been, you know, I remember when Meltzer was still, I, he might still be in my hometown of Campbell. But I mean, that's where the, the return address came from. That was maybe 15 years ago, but it doesn't matter. My point is, it's that like now it's a whole different ball game. So that's all I was trying to point out. It, it's politics. That, yeah. It's like now, anything else. Now it's, it's coming. It's coming. It's it's actually real. It's working into the real world, which is the funny Do you when TMZ was like a joke and now TMZ yeah. actually breaks real world news. Yeah, like no, that's, that's it's it's the weirdest thing. But as things change the reporting of it changes as well. I mean, I remember being devastated. If anybody doesn't know this, I'm so sorry to ruin it for you. When we were younger and reading like the wrestler and pro wrestling illustrated nine times out of 10, they were not actually interviewing those wrestlers. They were just right. writing whatever the hell they wanted based off of what they thought that character would say. Well, you know, I'm reading Bill after's book, which is a great read. And he talks a little bit about that. And, um, you know, it, it's pretty funny. Like so he's had good and like I'm where I'm at in the book. He's, you know, he wrote an obituary one time for a wrestler and it turned out that he was actually really alive. Oh, and uh, somebody uh, from New York gave him the information. So he printed it. They ran this whole obituary thing and, and then they had to do a, uh, you know, like a, they had a, a retraction. 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 I think that's what it is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It, is, oh. it is a retraction. But like he's he's talking about that, but it was all about, you know, Anyways, it was all part of the politics of it all. You know, go ahead. Sorry. So but, but I mean, wrap it up. even running a wrestling company, you know, we we send out press releases. We talk to the people. We do interviews. We we have to keep a conversation going because at the end of the day, there is stuff online that people live off of that. If you're not part of that conversation, you are a either going to be forgotten or b not going to be able to help put your word out there and help control that narrative. Do I want somebody to say a bunch of stuff about us that might not be accurate? Or would it be easier to sometimes have conversations and be like, here's what really happened. Here's what this is. And is is that, you know, speaking to the enemy or is it clarifying and making sure that the reality of a situation is known? That's what it is. Listen, that I, think, I don't know if we can think of a better way to end this episode than that. Honestly, I mean, holy shit. Kyle, uh, real quick, promote, because we'll say our goodbyes off the air for everybody the show's over. Kyle Davies, please tell everybody where they can find you, the NWA, anything else. Uh, NWA, you can find on Twitter or Instagram. You go to nationalwrestlingalliance.com. 
Uh, NWATix.com is where you're going to go for any tickets. We got a brand new pay per view coming up, Hard Times Three in uh, Chalmay, Louisiana. It's just right outside of New Orleans. That's going to be on November 12th. Also on November 13th, we're partnering with Wildcat Promotions, Luke Hawks' company. Uh, that's going to be the Revolution Rumble. Tickets again available NWATix.com. On Tuesdays, we have a brand new episode dropping of NWA Power on Fight. Subscribe on there. Replay is on Friday at 6.05 on YouTube, on our YouTube page. And then on Saturdays at noon, we have NWA USA. Also dropping on Tuesdays is the brand new podcast promoting Billy Corgan of the Smashing Pumpkins. Brand new album, Autumn, 33 tracks, 33 songs, classic. We're going to go over that. We're going to talk all about it. We have guests. We have all things going on. That's wherever you get podcasts. iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, whatever it is. That is called 33, hashtag WPC33. And last but not least, my name is Kyle Davis. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Kyle Davis ATL. Yes, I used to live in Atlanta. Now I live in Florida at the beach. I screwed up, but if I change it, everybody can't tag me in things that they used to. This guy's fucking smooth. I almost <laughs> like him. Jesus Christ. Almost. Somebody's got to like me. I I am I hate myself, so somebody I hope likes me. Real quick, and I'll wrap it up. This uh, podcast you guys are doing, is it a short-run podcast? Or once the, pod, you know, the album drops... Are you going to change it to different subjects? I mean, we're going to wait and see. We're on episode two right now. We just had the first two drop this week. And then uh, next week is when we start the weekly on Tuesdays. It's 33 episodes because there's 33 tracks on the new album. It's a space opera of sorts. Uh, we talk about all things like uh, aliens and basically the, the reason why. Yeah, it's, it gets real weird. But at the same time, it's interesting to see somebody be so open and talk about why they create what they create and the stories behind the music instead of having a kind of a shield up. Because as I always say, people are people. We're all human beings. Yeah. Um, do we go past 33? It remains to be seen. Right now we're on episode four that we've recorded. we got a few guests coming up. People that I never thought I'd talk to right now is somebody I never thought I'd talk to. So uh, I, I'm just having a very interesting month, to be honest with you. But uh, we're hoping it goes great. And uh, the more we hear about it, the more we get. And uh, we'll see where the world takes us. Well, he's Lars. I'm Dennis. That was Kyle Davis. Thank you so much. And uh, the show's over. Go home. We'll talk to you guys later.